Welcome to the Filipino American Women Project, a podcast show that shares stories and life lessons told by individuals living or have lived in America that are of Filipino descent and identify as female. I'm your host, Jen Amos, a fellow Filipino American woman, and I'm excited for you to join us. Let's get started. everyone, Jen Amos here, your host for the Filipino American Woman Project. And I have a surprise today. I have a co-host with me, Nani Dominguez. Nani, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hello. Yes. And why don't you tell everyone uh, just briefly how we met and then how you ended up being on the show today? So hi, everyone. I'm Nani. I connected with Jen on Instagram, just like a lot of other Filipino Americans that I see going through some sort of identity crisis or personal transformation and just looking to connect with and learn about their heritage and their roots, whether they're full, half, a quarter, and what have you. And um, I'm just here to offer a different perspective from someone who's maybe not ready to share my story yet because I feel like I'm mid-crisis still. And I don't really have any life lessons to give. <laughs> I'm the one who needs the life lessons. So, <laughs> yes, that's why I'm here. And thank you, Jen, for having me. Yes, it's my absolute pleasure. And uh, just like what Nani said, we just met on Instagram literally a couple of days ago and we spoke on the phone and it just seemed right to bring her on. And I'm just really excited to see what will come of this and see what I learned from you and and what you learned from this experience. So I just want to thank you again for deciding to jump into this. I mean, I'm I'm sure, I don't know if you were expecting (laughs) this to happen when we were going to talk, but here we are. No, not at all. (laughs) Yeah, like 48 hours later, you're on you're on an interview with us. Um, yeah, so, that's fine. I'm into it. <laughs> yes, yeah, awesome. Well, I am really excited. We have an amazing woman that we are interviewing today. And so I'm just going to dive in and introduce her. So Rhea Predikin is an educator, a coach, and a counselor. Rhea, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jen. And Nice to meet you um, over the phone, Nani. Uh, So I'm excited to have both of you interviewing me today. Yes, well, thank you. uh, Yeah, we're super excited. Uh, Why don't you start by sharing with everyone how you heard about the Filipino American Woman Project? I know we already talked about this prior to the call, but I thought it was really interesting and very relatable why you decided to and uh, and talking about Filipino history and, and how you've been able to find Filipino history late, like lately? Yeah, so I, um, like many people have mentioned, um, and Nani just mentioned that I found the Filipino American Woman Project through Instagram. And and that's where I found, you know, Filipino Women on the Rise and Entrepreneurship and the Tagalog Project, Read Filipino, all these other um, accounts that I have grown to know and love and follow. And I've just been taking in a lot of that content and learning more about Filipino American history, more about myself, because it's, it's not really told anywhere else. And so I find myself learning so much about our culture through Instagram and through the stories that are being shared there on that social media platform, which is like really, um, just really unexpected. And I, that's how I came across the Filipino American Woman Project. Um, so I'm so happy to hear other stories and have been listening to the podcast. And um, and so it just adds on to the, the content that I'm seeing on Instagram. Yeah, I, I love how you said that. And uh, let's see, this project, the Filipino American Woman Project, started back in December 2016. This was uh, a couple of days after Christmas, and I forgot exactly how... I was inspired or or how the idea came about, but I remember trying to Google Filipino American women 
And uh, I won't spoil anything. I'll, I guess I can encourage our listeners to look it up themselves. But at the time, I didn't really find a lot of positive things about us. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, at the time I had uh, run an online marketing agency and I just thought, you know, I'm a, I'm a millennial and the generation after me, they're, they're going to grow up with phones in their hands and their phone is going to be their number one teacher. You know, there was a generation where kids would learn from television, but now people, you know, kids are learning learning from their phone. And I just thought, mm -hmm. you know, I don't have kids yet, but if or when I do, I want to be able to uh, be the change that I want to see and, and be able to provide accessible uh, information about us. And so at the time, it just made a lot of sense to do uh, Facebook Live because at the time uh, it was becoming popular and I and I knew it was going to be a great way to get uh, easy organic reach and all these things. And mm -hmm. uh, and so I think it's really cool how today it's uh, it wasn't just me who who felt like they needed to learn about their culture or even put it out, you know, put out that search or put the search out there yeah. to learn uh, through social media. And, you know, lately my favorite Instagram account. This is a shout out to Anna Marie Cruz with Entrepreneurship. I love following her accounts. We actually interviewed her recently as well. So if you want yes, to listen to that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if, if everyone wants to listen to that, I believe that's episode four. <laughs> little, <laughs> little plug in there. And I, I love seeing her post because she uh, really gets into the history of things. And uh, it's kind of like my daily my, my daily dose of Filipino history. So I just, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. So Anna, if you're listening to this, <laughs> I'm going to have to like tag her in a, in a post later, but yeah. So uh, thank you, Ria. I I'm glad that you shared that because I, I think it's, it's really relatable. And uh, you know, if we're, if this is what we're doing, imagine what the future generation is going to be doing. Anyway, Ria, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and what makes you, like why you identify as a Filipino American woman today? Yeah, so I was originally from Los Angeles. I've been out here in the Midwest um, in the city of Chicago for about 11 years now. And I actually uh, grew up in historic Filipino town and it wasn't called Hi-Fi back then, but, um, and probably for the first few years of my life before moving to West Covina, which is another area with a lot of uh, Filipino community, and then Walnut, California, before moving out here to Chicago. And so it's interesting to think about the context of where you grew up and where you live. And back then, I didn't really have to think about what it meant to be Filipino American, mm -hmm. because I knew so many Filipino Americans. There was a seafood city uh, in our neighborhood. There was, you know, Manila Sunset, uh, Red Ribbon, all these Filipino bakeries and restaurants. And then as an adult, it's really when I had to confront what it meant to be Filipino American and kind of feeling embarrassed that I didn't really know what that meant in a context where I'm, where there weren't a lot of Filipinos and it's the Midwest. So it's predominantly uh, white and black and Latinx. And, and that's where I've really had to like discover what that means. And I'm identified as being Filipino American because my both my parents were born and raised in the Philippines. My maternal grandfather served in the U.S. Navy, and he became a naturalized U.S. citizen at that time. So his children automatically became U.S. citizens, and that's what um, brought my my mother to Los Angeles. And then it's here in my work as a as a counselor in Chicago public schools, and then now as a coach at the Network for College Success that I've had to really define what it means to be Filipino American. And I actually haven't been able to like really hone in on what that means. And it was on a recent trip to the Philippines that I was starting to explore what, what that means to me and what that would mean for my children growing up. Yeah, uh, I think that's really interesting. I, I mean, I fairly grew up in I was basically raised around like my relatives and in, in high school, it, I had a very, fairly diverse group of classmates and stuff. And it was really uh, kind of what you said. It was really in my adult life uh, when I was in college. I wasn't I wasn't put in the middle of like white America or anything, but I was part of this <laughs> Filipino organization. And it was the first time I really didn't realize I didn't know much about my Filipino heritage. I I learned about um, 
uh, what was that March called? You you both know what I'm talking about. It's uh, it's for the veterans. <laughs> Oh, uh, I don't know. know. <laughs> it's You're called, embarrassing us. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, it's, <laughs> it's called so We're Not Good Filipinas. <laughs> yeah. oh, I rem okay, I remember. It was the JFAV March, and I believe it was Justice for Filipino American Veterans. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are the, yeah, I remember it now because my grandpa was actually a, uh, a veteran in World War II. He fought, uh, I, I don't know if he was on the American side or the Filipino side. I forgot. Hi everyone, Jen Amos here. I just have to interject at this point because I wouldn't be doing my grandpa and his brother any justice if I didn't um, do a little research and tell you a little bit part of my family's story uh, during World War II. <laughs> and so, and so uh, in the moment of talking to these ladies, I completely forgot so as I edit this, I thought, I'm just going to slip this in here. So anyway, in case you've never heard of JFAV, which is an acronym for Justice for Filipino American Veterans, JFAV is a national alliance of Filipino veterans and organizations and other advocates in which every year they would do a march to serve as a reminder to ensure that the sacrifices made by Filipinos during World War II weren't forgotten. As I have mentioned in this interview, my grandpa uh, actually served in World War II. And uh, I also wanted to add that my grandpa's brother uh, actually passed away during the Bataan Death March, which took place in 1942 during World War II as well. I'm not a historian in any way, <laughs> but if you want to learn more about um, these times, then I recommend that you go online or whatever you do to learn more. But just a little background, my uh, both of my grandparents were involved during World War II, and that's a little bit about what we were discussing. And when I was in college, I it didn't dawn to me that my grandpa hadn't received his benefits after serving in World War II for a very long time. And lucky today, he is 92, but it was really only, I think, almost a decade ago, if not recently, that he finally received a lump sum for having served in um, the American military. So highly recommend, if you don't know much about this, the injustice that took place for the Filipinos that fought on the side of America and fought as the American military. Highly recommend that you look into it. And it's a part of my family story that even I myself am still learning, which is why I'm sort of stumbling learning about this. And I highly encourage that you read more into it if you're interested. All right, back to the interview. Uh, but anyway, I remember in college, like all, like I remember my friends were so passionate about, you know, Filipino justice and, and our rights and everything. And I felt so disconnected because I, I really didn't know that I had to be a proud Filipino. It's not like I was embarrassed. I just wasn't mm -hmm. aware. And so I think it's interesting how, you know, you, you were in that community, which I didn't know. I didn't know historic Filipino town was known as high five for short, by the way. So that's a new <laughs> I'm hearing that for the first time as well. And the only, my only reference to West Covina is Crazy Ex Girlfriend on uh, oh. like I was looking at Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about that. Yeah, where the star, like the main guy is Filipino. And I was like, yes. <laughs> like, uh -huh. um, but anyway, I, I think it's, it is kind of interesting how, um, you know, we think our lives are so normal until we're put into a position where it's like, oh, I, I'm different and, and people are asking me why I'm different and I have mm -hmm. to explain myself about that. And so, uh, Nani, I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that as well before we um, have Bria chime back in. Yeah, I mean, I grew up in a split household. My parents were divorced. My dad is Filipino American. He was born in the Philippines and my mom is Russian American. So I grew up very confused. <laughs> culturally just two very different households and I've always felt kind of that difference that you say and Rhea I'd actually love to hear more about your trip to the Philippines because in my 
kind of whatever this is that I'm going through right now, <laughs> I've been mm -hmm. feeling some weird kind of pull to go there and to take a trip there and to, you know, not go to the pretty beaches and everything, but actually explore the islands and learn about the culture and do a similar sort of exploration trip like you were explaining. My only problem is that <laughs> I can't find anyone to go with me. <laughs> you know, that's not something that you can ask anyone to go with you to do. But I, I find that kind of disconnect with my family and that they're not interested in, in doing that kind of thing. And I am. So I'm, you know, happy that I'm able to connect with people this way that are kind of doing the same thing. And that's, that's really helped me a lot so far. Yeah, the, um, the, tr the trip that I went on the, uh, in 2016, actually, I went with my, she was, my daughter was three and um, oh, my wow. husband and my family. And we went to a historical tour with a political activist, um, Carlos Seldron. We were in mm -hmm. Iberos in Manila and we were standing inside a bomb shelter. And that's when I really learned a lot about the Philippines' role in World War II. And you hear so much about Japan and America and Pearl Harbor and all that. And I was like, they did not mention the Philippines when I was right. reading that's history, you know? And right. <laughs> big roles to play. And, and just uh, referencing back to the um, growing up in a Filipino community, although I was in that community we didn't really talk about um what it meant to be filipino because i remember walk i'd always walk past this bust of jose rizal going into seafood city it was like in the parking lot before seafood it was just random right and uh, i didn't know mm -hmm. who he was really it wasn't i didn't learn about him in american history and and it was only really until that recent trip to the philippines that that i learned more about jose rizal and and it's things like that like although i was seeing it I've, all the time. I didn't really know what that meant and who he was and right. what he meant. You don't to understand the weight of it until you're there. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. And that's, yeah, that's exactly what I'm kind of like itching to do right now. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely a transformative experience to just like be there in this, in this place with so much history. Um, yeah, I, I uh, actually, I went on a trip to the Philippines a couple of years ago with a bunch of community leaders in San Diego at the time. And I remember it was, oh my gosh, I'm totally drawing a blank right now. Just, this was yeah. years ago. This was years ago already. But <laughs> essentially what we did, it was the first time I went to the Philippines with, uh, without my family. I would usually go with my family. And it was just, you know, a bunch of community leaders like, uh, um, successful Filipino business owners and, uh, and some call in like, I think two college students, and we all decided to, um, you know, go there together. Okay. Hi, everyone. I wanted to cut in once again to get into a little more detail and background about this trip I went on. I actually had to do some research because it's been some time now. Back in 2014, I went with some awesome people from San Diego Shout out to Aaron, Savannah, Kuya Rico, DJ, Kuya Tony, Ate, Sherry, and Al, amongst other people. This was shortly after Typhoon Haiyan, also known as Typhoon Yolanda. Feel free to look that up. Just hit the Philippines. This was back in 2014. And Savannah, Aaron, and I, Savannah and Aaron were college students at the time, and I had already been an alumni of San Diego State but we had been invited and sponsored to travel with Gaiwa Galinga, which is uh, also known as GK for short. And if you've never heard of GK before, their core activities relate to long-term improvement in the housing and community building for and by every poor Filipino who have historically lived in slums. So we, our main goal going to the Philippines was to build homes, even the, especially the homes that we had already built that were damaged by the typhoon. This was a nine day trip with some amazing people. If you're interested in learning more about Gaiwad Galinga or GK for short, you can just visit their website at gk1world.com. All right, so now I'm gonna jump right back into the interview to share a little more details about my trip. And we were able to get a tour. Uh, we were doing some missionary work but in between all that, we were getting a tour of the best as well as the worst of the Philippines. And mm -hmm. after having gone through that experience, one of the one of the experiences that really uh, hit me, there's there's two of them, but one of them was uh, 
going to a cemetery and seeing families having built homes around the cemetery because okay. it was like cheap land, if not, you know, free land. And and they were just, that was just their normal. And you see all these kids running around and, and they're the happiest kids in the world. Like they could care less right. they about where know. they live. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so right. there, there was that. And then the second one was, um, this was after the hurricane that had, I think it's, is it called, I never know the difference between t- a typhoon or a hurricane, but oh. I believe it was Hurricane Yolanda. <laughs> mm-hmm. Someone please correct me if I, if I have it wrong. We were visiting uh, this, this lady's house and we, when we came in, we had to we had a, a duck our head because the roof was really low and it turned out that the hurricane uh, blew off like her second floor, like her entire second floor. And I, and we were able to ask her questions and we had a translator cause I, I don't speak Tagalog. Unfortunately, I remember asking her through the translator. I said, do you have house insurance? <laughs> you know, do you have like mm-hmm. something to, to help pay for this? And she's like, no. And that was a big, that was a big moment for me to think, wow, like in certain places in the Philippines, once you lose, you know, a big part of your, whatever you own, you, you, you don't have such things as insurance to, to right. get it back. And it got me to realize that my family really came from like a middle class. Like they, like they didn't have the prettiest looking houses, but they were farmers. They owned land and property. At, at the time I thought that wasn't, you know, that wasn't considered like you know, good. And so, but I haven't go through, gone through that experience of seeing the best and the worst of the Philippines. It made me appreciate like my family a lot more. So, so Nani, I think, I think it would be super awesome for you to go to the Philippines, however you go. And I'm, and I know there were some yeah. pro- programs out there, which I'm happy to actually, that's a good thing to take note of, of inviting, inviting people who host those programs uh, to get interviewed on the show. <laughs> and, yeah. and, uh, you know, invite people to be a part of that. So that's, that's a, just totally came up with an idea for me. So thank you for, yeah. thank you for that, Nani. <laughs> of course. Uh, so I want to, I want to go back to Ria. So Ria, you mentioned that it was really in your adult life where you, you had to learn who you were as a Filipino. Can you tell us a little more about that? Like why you had to do that? I, I think two things, becoming a mother and helping my children you know, kind of facilitate their own identity development and when, and helping them think about who they are and what ethnicity they are. And the other would be that for work at the University of Chicago, where I work at the Network for College Success, we do a lot of work around equity and transforming public schools into equitable spaces. And that requires us to look within and explore the skin that we're in. And so we have to write these equity stances that, we, that we're like always fine tuning and it's a living, breathing document that we work on. And then we display it within our organization to explain like what we stand for, who we are, kind of like what's our background and what basically the answer is like, what's the skin that I'm in? And Mm -hmm. I had such a hard time writing it because I'm like, I'm Filipino American and I'm just like, okay, well, how do I add more to this? What does that mean? Yeah, it's got to be more than one sentence. (laughs) And uh, what, you know, like, why do I identify as Filipino American? What does that mean? And I've been there for uh, six years now. And it's like an ongoing identity exploration to figure out like my own childhood experiences in education and to now discover what it means to be a Filipino American mom raising biracial children. And not only are they biracial, but we're interfaith. I grew up Catholic and my husband is Jewish American. And so to think about all those different intersections of religion and race and then also the geography of like living in the midwest versus the west coast where that's predominantly where filipino communities are oh man (laughs) 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 all right jenny was here jumping into the middle of our show as i always do to remind you why this show is possible so you know at the end of every episode i tend to say If you didn't catch our guest contact info, don't worry, we'll have those in the show notes. Check them out. I worked so hard on them. You're welcome. Well, it's been brought to my attention that our show notes are not as easy to find as I thought, which is why starting summer 2020, the Filipino American Woman Project is proud to be partnering with Captivate, the world's only growth-oriented podcast host. 
Captivate is created for independent podcasters, designed from day one to help you to focus on audience growth and the expansion of your audio influence. One way that Captivate makes our lives easier as independent podcasters is by taking the guesswork out of making a website for your show. That's right, a website for your show. So listeners, starting summer 2020, finding our show notes will be so much easier. All thanks to Captivate. You're welcome, as always. If you're about to start podcasting or are getting burnt out from all the extra work of producing one, like building a website, consider a seven-day free trial, that's right, free, with Captivate by visiting thephilamwoman.com. That's the philam, short for Filipino-American, woman.com. Or, you know, check out our show notes in the meantime, which is in the details section of each episode. Once again, you can visit thephilamwoman.com or visit the details section of this episode. You know, this, this reminds me of a a conversation. I, an interview I had like two years ago, I I forgot who it was with specifically, but I started kind of repeating it um, every episode after that. And I feel like the, the beautiful thing about being, uh, having Filipino descent is because, you know, it it could be mixed with so many things, essentially. That's what we we've come to find and what's very normal, like interracial marriages and being a mestiza like like Nani here. And and so, you know, with everything you just listed, Rhea, like like, you know, Catholic, Jewish, Midwest, you know, uh, (laughs) you know, all these things, I feel like for your kids, I feel like you have blessed them with this huge library. You know, you have you have the Filipino section, you have the Jewish Catholic se- section, you have the mm-hmm. Chicago culture, you'll have the LA culture, and I feel like it you know, it'll be up to your kids to decide like what what books will they take off of those shelves and define themselves essentially, but but knowing that they can always uh, switch it up <laughs> if, yes, if if they yes, want right. to. Yeah. And so I'm just curious, like you have two kids, correct? Mm -hmm. And so how are you uh, teaching them now? And and I believe they're young kids, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what are you doing now that you feel like is is working for your kids? (laughs) Well, you know, people, I think, wonder if it confuses them that I'm exposing them to so much, like not only just Filipino culture, but I want them to know that there's lots of other cultures. So you know, that there is a whole world out there and not only exposing them to Jewish and Catholic religions, but lots of other religions as well, because to narrow it down to only what we know would just kind of do them a disservice to not know that there's a whole world of other um, beautiful cultures and religions that we may not participate in, but that exist. And I think about like my worst fear as they grow up into adults would be for them to not say that they were Filipino American or that they were, you know, to just say like, oh, my mom's Filipino, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. That would make me really sad (laughs) to think that I didn't, didn't provide enough experience or exposure to the Filipino culture for them. And realizing that there isn't a lot of that, especially in the city of Chicago, I I think if I were in the suburbs, um, there are definitely uh, more Filipinos in uh, the suburban communities, but there isn't a lot of Filipinos that I run into. And so we can't just go to Filipino restaurants down the street. And I think that more than just like the food, but the cultural experiences and you know, growing up in the Midwest for them, I think it's going to be even more important for me to provide that community and that knowledge for them and exposure. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I've been able to take my daughter twice to the Philippines already. However, my son who just turned two, uh, I'm just a little worried about the 20 hour flight. So I really would like to, luckily my parents, uh, they live with us and they're exposing parts of that Filipino culture just in our everyday life, you know, that my right. parents live with us and we're a multi-generational family, which is already like not the norm in American households. And that my parents are very much involved in their lives and they they go to church religiously every Sunday. And so they get exposed to all these things that are part of Filipino culture. And then the food that my, my dad loves to cook and he cooks Filipino food for dinner. And so I think all of that, that I'm trying to ensure that they know what it means um, so that they can grow up and hopefully identify as being part Filipino American. 
Yeah. Nani, I heard you agreeing a lot. Did you want to add to that? (laughs) I know. I was like, oh, wow, I caught myself doing that too. But no, you were speaking to a lot of what I feel kind of on the other end. I, I really appreciate your desire to provide that kind of background for your kids because that's something that I often in this, these kind of recent months get frustrated a lot with my parents and grandparents because I also grew up in a, like I said, a split household, which was, you know, different cultures, different religions. My dad's family was obviously very Catholic and my mom's family was very atheist. So that also put me in a very confusing circumstance growing up. I also created my blog a long time ago for that exact reason, to kind of create a library of my experience and my, you know, documenting me figuring this this whole thing out so that hopefully they can learn from those lessons later. And I don't have kids. This is totally like my <laughs> whatever you call it, um, obsessive Future compulsive plans. disorder <laughs> uh, or anxiety where I just worry about things that don't even apply to me. But that is something that I think about a lot because it is important to explain things to your kids in an interfaith, multicultural family or what have you. So I, I appreciate that. Thanks. So it sounds like to me, the common, uh, I, I believe what's part, if there is a, a Filipino American uh, culture, because it, it's so it's, I think it's just open to interpretation. But I feel like the commonality amongst a lot of us is exploration of who we are. Uh, because mm-hmm. we do kind of come up, come from a very messy background, <laughs> you know, like getting mm-hmm. colonized for a couple centuries and, yes. and everything. So it's, it is, uh, it, to me, it's very reassuring because, you know, my neighbors, I, I live in a very, uh, like a white dominated uh, community right now. And when I first met my neighbors, the first thing they ask is, you know, what are you or where are you from? Because, you know, I'm dark skin mm-hmm. and everything. And, you know, I could say something clever like, oh, I'm from San Diego. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, <laughs> I, I could say something Good like answer. that. Like, <laughs> you know, oh, I'm human. I'm from, you know, I'm from right. my mother, you know, like all like you right. No, But I, 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 I knew what they were asking. And I let them know that like I was Filipino and, you know, it's just, it's just interesting to be put into that situation. And, and I, but I also think it's a good motivation to be like, you know, like I I should learn about myself because other than being called, other than me saying I'm Filipino, like that's kind of like the extent of what I know being Filipino is just saying I'm Filipino and my parents are immigrant parents and they're Filipino. But you ask me about my culture, you ask me about technically I'm three ethnicities. I'm like, or I I should speak like three dialogues dialects um Kapong mm-hmm. Bangong, uh Ilocano and Tagalog I'm supposed to mm-hmm. know all three of those I know none <laughs> and, yeah. and and yet I I've come to a place where I'm like that's okay because I like who I am and and how I am is part of it, it contributes to the overall Filipino American experience because it's complicated and and we all are you know different generations and and just hearing both of you uh, share your story and you know the commonality of like yeah I don't know much about my background or my my heritage it's very reassuring and really affirms that you know this is part of the experience so so awesome. I, I do have a question uh, for you, Ria. It sounds like you're doing a lot for your kids. You're very self-aware about like the different layers and dimensions to who you are and your husband and where you currently live. Do you feel like it's a, almost a burden to be that educator to your kids, even to represent yourself? Like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if people ask you the same questions too. Like, what are you? Where are you from? Um, do you that. see? Yeah. Do you do you feel like that's a burden or more of like I'm I'm proud? Like this this is my responsibility. Uh, I think it's kind of exhausting to always be seen as like this like perpetual foreigner, no matter where I go. If mm-hmm. it's uh, you know, well, except for Los Angeles. <laughs> 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 and I guess I am kind of sassy because I do say like, oh, I'm from Los Angeles. And then I'm like, you know, people, they're still like, but where are you really from? And mm-hmm. it, well, I'm, yeah, I was born and raised in Los Angeles. Now, you know, then it's, well, my parents were born in the Philippines. And so I am, you know, my ethnicity is Filipino American. And, um, and yeah, it gets kind of exhausting to always feel like, you know, people are wondering who I am. And it was actually interesting because we were um, spending time in my husband's family's lake house in, in a small town of Wisconsin. And my daughter was 
playing in the playground. Uh, so it's most, it's all white people. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I was sitting with, I was try- chasing my son around and I see her talking to two little girls. And, and so I'm like, well, I want to, I'm going to listen in on their conversation. And uh, one of the little girls is asking my daughter, oh, um, are you Chinese? Or are you Japanese? And she's like, oh no, I speak Japanese, which she was in a Japanese immersion school. So it like further confuses her. And then she's <laughs> like, well, um, so the girl's like, okay, that's like not the answer I wanted. Right. So then she's like, was well, your mom Chinese or Japanese? And then she's like, no, but my friend's mom is Japanese. And so she's like, <laughs> it's funny to um, hear this, you know, my six-year-old have this conversation and not realizing that people are wondering what she is. And then so I said, so I come over and intervene. And I'm like, Bella, she's asking what you are. And she says, oh, I'm half Filipino, half white. And a lot of my family is from the Philippines. And so it's just like, so matter of fact that I, it just like made me kind of giggle in the moment that like, at least she, she does know who she is, but it was funny that she didn't know why people were asking her that. And so, um, I think it's, it's something I've definitely gotten used to that people are always wondering where I'm from. Um, Mm -hmm. but I think that, I think it's also empowering for me to be able to own and develop my own story and develop that with my children and my family so that, instead of having someone tell my story or make assumptions about who we are, it's kind of empowering as an adult to, to reconnect with my cultural roots and to go back to the Philippines now as an adult and to discover what that means. And I think at the time of like growing up in Los Angeles in the eighties, it's, it was all about assimilation and for my parents to assimilate to American culture and for us to fit in and to blend in. And I think that's also what was taught in schools. And so I used to speak Tagalog and now I can only understand it. But my parents said that I can't remember which teacher it was, but a teacher said that they should speak to me in English instead of speaking to me in Tagalog so that I would learn to speak English, I guess, or that I would be speaking that at home instead of our, instead of our language of Tagalog. And so I think that back then it was really about assimilating and, and now as an adult and and in this generation, it's about like being, feeling empowered to know where you're from and your cultural roots and to be able to pass that down. Yeah. I, I think that's really beautiful and very well said. And I feel like culturally, it's becoming more popular to represent where you're from and be proud of, you know, I feel like nowadays people are, maybe it's because of Instagram, but I feel like more (laughs) people are just accepting their bodies for what they are, you know, Mm -hmm. a lot of uh, body positive messages out there. And uh, I think, I think there's no better time to, you know, celebrate our roots, uh, however much we know about it than ever before. So I, I think that's really awesome. Um, Nani, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Not, not too much. You covered a lot of it. I definitely have gotten that question my entire life, <laughs> everywhere <laughs> I go. And for me, it's always a really overwhelming experience because I've had to, I mean, most people, when you see me, you just think that I'm white and you write me off as that. But there have been instances like when I get my nails done and the nail ladies will be looking at me and they'll be like, what, what's your uh, ethnicity? And I'll tell them Russian and, and Filipina. And they'll be like, Filipina? No, maybe <laughs> Korean, maybe Japanese. Like I'll literally have to pull out pictures and show them pictures of my family. Like, no, I'm Filipina. <laughs> And it's just kind of always a battle for me to defend that, I guess, which is tiring, <laughs> to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And to uh, feel like you're maybe like not Filipino enough or you're, you know, like mm-hmm. right. American and like the fact that we can't speak the language fluently or, you know, those kind of things that like we were born there. And so does that make us less, right. you know? Right, exactly. It's kind of like that experience is taken away from you, you know, from a stranger that doesn't even know you. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's interesting. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, I agree with both of you and it's, um, I, I'm, I'm sure there's a reason for this. (laughs) I I feel like (laughs) one day it's going to make sense why we have to keep explaining ourselves, uh, no matter where we go. Uh, until then, I I applaud you both for your resiliency, and uh, you know even 
because of this experience, it's it's like the catalyst for us to really want to learn who we are since people are asking us anyway. <laughs> right, so, right, absolutely. exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I, I love it. All right, so I want to go ahead and shift gears and uh, talk. What, one of the reasons why we have this project is because we want to be able to publish a book where we share life lessons and stories told by the Filipino American woman. And so, uh, Ria, you uh, had mentioned in your questionnaire that motherhood has been a huge life lesson for you. And so, I'd love to hear why you have chosen to share, you know, your experience of motherhood as a life lesson for today. Yes, uh, I think um, motherhood is like really the one role and job that I've taken on that has really helped me uh, discover my own identity um, and discover my own strength and resiliency. And it's so tied into who I am culturally because I started out motherhood. um, I basically started out as a single mother because I was in a marriage that was like pretty terrible and, and the Catholic guilt uh, and the fact that there was a divorce in the Philippines. And so in the Filipino community, that's not um, really, you know, acceptable, I guess that mm-hmm. yeah. I stayed in this marriage for far too long. And, and it was really in this, the hospital room when I had my daughter, the day I became mother. And I'm realizing that like, to be a, a mother and to be fully present for her, I had to like really find my own my own joy and find a way to like live my life fully so that I could be fully present for her. And um, that's where I found my strength to find who I was like, you know, amidst all these like really uh, complex emotions of like sadness and like kind of like just like not knowing who I was. And fast forward to today, I'm in a, in a happy marriage for um, almost three years now and wow. two kids. Yeah. And, and now I, I know what it means to be in a, um, in like a partnership, a true partnership with someone who is like there for you and you want to be there for them. And, and I wouldn't have ever found where I am today and like where I feel like I'm in a really good place, like in my career and in my family life and my personal life is because of the journey I've had to take as um, a mother. And as I think about like telling our stories um, at the time, I was like very ashamed of like, oh, I, I was a single mom and like I, I didn't want that to define me and that like somehow I was this person who, you know, didn't follow like the the natural progression of like, you know, find someone, get married, have kids, like have a home. And, and this idea of like what I thought like society expects of you to have like, like a good life instead of like, you know, kind of letting that like shame define me. I felt like I should use that story to help empower me because that is who I am today because of the the strength that I found in being a single mom. And then also the support that I had from my family, from my parents and my sister, as I was raising my, my young daughter. Um, And so I think that is one of the big life lessons and it's, it's a continual journey, um, motherhood to figure out who I need to be for them and to, um, to like discover all these things about like, how do I help them facilitate their own identity formation, be it like racially, culturally, religiously, that I'm always learning. I'm constantly like looking for ways for um, me to support that identity formation for them and for myself. Wow, that's incredible. And I I love hearing that, you know, sometimes I think when, um, people think of marriage, I think, oh, our problems are going to go away. But for you, you're like, no, I am going to address this head on. This is not a healthy relationship. I want to have a better life for my daughter. And, you know, it didn't just get you to uh, bring her to a better place, but it, it brought, you know, she motivated you to put yourself in a better place. And like you said, find your own joy and uh, really overcome uh, those mental blocks of like Catholic guilt and and shame. And so I- I just want to applaud you for that. And and I'm sure that probably already feels like a lifetime ago. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but I, I think that's incredible because sometimes like, like, you know, for me, I was with my ex for six or seven years and 
part of why uh, I stayed with him at the time was because I lost my virginity to him and being raised Catholic, I thought, okay, if I give my virginity to someone, I have to be with them forever, even if they're oh, abusive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I guess this is it for me. <laughs> and then when I, when I finally broke it off, like it, it, um, I really had to go through this like mental work of being like, you know, it's okay. It's, you know, that, that was, uh, that, probably culturally made sense at whatever time I was taught that to like be with someone and give, you know, save it for one person and only for one person. Um, but I, I think it's a, it, I think it also makes you more humbled and, and empathetic to other people when you've gone through something like that. And, uh, and I think, and I, and, you know, throughout this entire interview, you keep bringing up your children and it, it really sounds like all the things that you've gone through is to um, like feed your children with a positive upbringing. And so I, I think that's really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. And I think it's like, you know, it's, it's for both um, my children and for myself, you know, cause I think a lot of times um, women can get lost um, and not know who they are after motherhood. I mean, just growing a human inside your body is, um, is just like this life changing experience. And, but to redefine who you are as um, a mother is just like this, just total transformation. And I think that it's been both a blessing to um, learn more about my children and who they are as, as these little people, but also to learn more about myself um, mm-hmm. in the process. I, I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like when you be, I'm not a mother, like I have a dog, <laughs> but that's about it. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like <laughs> I feel like when you become a mother uh, or at least go through like some major life change such as that, you almost have like the second chance at life. I I think of uh, one of my friends who had like I knew her since yeah, I knew her in high school and she was just an awful person in so many ways. But one day I found her on Facebook and, um, you know, she changed her last name to her husband's and she had had kids. And all of a sudden she was this very religious, lovely, compassionate woman. And I just thought, man, like I knew you in your former, former life. And, (laughs) and it almost seems like, like, yeah, having, having children, I mean, you can, you can tell us obviously, like, since you're Mm -hmm. the one with, with kids here, but like, yeah, it's like, you really have to make, uh, especially if you're a good mother, in my opinion, like you really have to make these decisions. Like is, am I going to keep sustaining this old life? Like, are those the way that I have lived in the in the mantras and philosophies I lived by is that going to help my 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 new family and my children and their upbringing and so I, I can only imagine like it's not just a physical transformation but it's emotional mental spiritual it's like an everything uh transformation yeah absolutely but and then also not that like all of a sudden I give birth in the hospital and I've figured out who I am overnight because <laughs> <laughs> because I think it's the, the actual journey of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I have uh, a younger sister and she doesn't have children yet. And I think there's this idea that you have to like be ready and like, you know, mentally and, you know, financially and all these things that you'll have it all figured out. And then you have this baby, but um, I definitely don't have it all figured out and I figure it out uh, along the way. And I think that's the whole process to discover who I am while also being a mother that I don't have to have all the answers. And in fact, uh, when my daughter asks me a question and I don't know it, um, that's okay. Like we can discover it together because Mm -hmm. there's no way I could know all the answers to everything in life. I'm still figuring out what it means to be Filipino American, you know, and we'll discover that together. Yeah. I think that's, that's a good lesson in itself is that life is really, even if you're, whether you're Filipino or, or not, uh, life is all about exploration and not just sitting with whatever stereotypes or, um, you know, childhood beliefs <laughs> you, you, you had. And so, uh, Nani, I'm curious to see if you had any thoughts you wanted to add to this as well. Yeah. I mean, I, again, don't have kids yet either. And that's kind of like, if you ask me at age 15, where I thought I would be in five years, my answer was default, you know, oh, I'll have two kids, maybe another one on the way, of course, expected to be married. And I never, I never really questioned that until, you know, now here I am at 27 and none of that has happened. And so that's kind of what sparked this whole exploration for me is if that's not what I'm here to do, what is my purpose? And that's, you know, I guess you can go through that before or after motherhood. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Well said. Well, I can't believe this, but we have all been talking for about 45 minutes now, uh, maybe an hour, including the pre the pre recording. Uh, and, and I think it's a good this is a good time to kind of wrap up. And uh, for anyone that's listening, if you uh, if this resonates with you in any way, we'd love to hear from you. You can actually visit our show notes and uh, leave us a voice message or email us. Uh, but either way, we would love to hear from you and uh, see if this resonated with you in any Anyway, uh, Ria, do you have any closing thoughts or anything else you want to share with our listeners today? I just want to thank you, Jen, for creating this space and this community for us to share our stories. And I'm excited to hear more, more from the other women who you'll be interviewing. And I just appreciate that there's a space for us to share our stories and to hear others because of doing that, we're learning more about ourselves. So thank you. Oh, well, it's my absolute pleasure. And it helps me too, <laughs> selfishly. <laughs> so, right. It, yeah, I think I think, I think it's we're just, all here for that same reason. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's it's really just, you know, like I mentioned, the, this project started for me because around Christmas time, I was in this place I, I had been uh, fairly involved in. I was in and out of the Filipino community uh, since college when I first joined this Filipino organization. And part of why I was in and out of it is because I had this love-hate relationship with the community. And i uh, that's a conversation for another time. But I got <laughs> to a, a place where I was like, what is it? And and I realized I had to look within and then and then really ask the question, well, you know, who am I? Like, who am I as a, like, why, why do I have this conflicting relationship with the Filipino community? Well, maybe I haven't really addressed who I am as a Filipino American woman and having very minimal resources. I mean, other than maybe like textbooks or something that I didn't really want to read, I, I, I was like, I have to find another way. And as we all know, facts tell, but stories sell. And I <laughs> wanted to be drawn in um, and learn about my history through oral history, really. And so that's how the project came about. And then, you know, I had to, I had to take a break for a year, whole other story for another time, but I'm just, but thank you for saying that uh, because it, it feeds me as well. It, it helps me a lot to hear everyone else's stories. And so I'm just, I just want to thank you both. Nani, thank you so much for co-hosting with me. Uh, any final words that's from fun. you? <laughs> No, that was a good first try for me. <laughs> yeah, you did great. <laughs> yes, you yeah, did. Thank you, Ria, for sharing. Yes. Yeah. And um, if anyone wants to follow Ria, she is on Instagram at Urban Ohana. Ria, why don't you uh, explain why you chose that? I, 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 it, to me, it makes sense. It's like it's this uh, islander girl in the city. Yeah. That's how yeah. I interpret it. So why don't you <laughs> definitely? <laughs> Yeah. So that, did I get it right? I did get it right. Okay. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and Ohana, well, from Lilo and Stitch, like that idea that where no one gets left behind, that's really like how I could describe my family, that we just, um, we're always there for each other and no one gets left behind. And, and my sister and I have that tattooed. Um, so, you know, I just kind of had to use that as a handle. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I got no choice, but it's yeah. a great name. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. No, I love it. So uh, to our listeners, if you want to follow Ria, you can find her on Urban Ohana on Instagram. Um, and I'm sure she can uh, tell you more about how about what she's up to and what she does in her day to day and at her job um, at the college or at the University of Chicago. And um, with that said, I want to thank you both so much for your time. Thank you so much, Nani. And thank you so much, Ria. And uh, I look forward to growing this community together. And if we have some listeners calling in and asking some follow-up questions, hopefully we'll have Ria back on the show again in the future. So thank you both so much. And I hope you both have a great evening and to our listeners as well. Thank you. You as well. See you next time. And there you have it, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Please subscribe if you'd like to hear more stories and life lessons told by the Filipino American woman. If you're interested in sharing your story, please contact us at the Filipino American woman at gmail.com or find us on Instagram at the Filipino American woman. Until next time.